Hey, Stephanie, thank you for joining me again for a Plenty Dev update. We've been going through and the pace of updates has been really fast lately. So I figured if we weren't doing these on a regular basis that we would forget about all the things that are going into it. So I just wanted to go through and take a look at some of the things that have been done recently. Cool. So uh, let me share my screen. Let me flip over here. So um, do you see this Roxo blog here? Yep. This must look familiar to you since this is a theme that you created at one point. Um, maybe there have been some updates since then, but uh, it, this is largely something that you created back in the day. Do you remember uh, setting this up? I do. Yeah. Um, what was that process like back then? It was probably interesting. This, is your, this was your first Plenty site, right? Um, maybe not technically my first, but um, it was pretty easy considering like I'm not a developer. So um, it was just a lot of copy and pasting once I understood the structure of Plenty. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think you definitely helped me button it up quite a bit. But um, for the most part, I was surprised how easy it was to recreate uh, a lot of the different pages. Yeah, I, I think you did an awesome job. Like it, it really looks like a great site. And I know we, you know, we're copying this from a, from a, an existing theme, but like you put it together in a way that really makes sense. So um, I, I'm glad that you were able to figure all that out and get the client side routing and everything working. So mm -hmm. um, it's pretty cool. Um, so I figured out this would be a good starting place to look at some of the updates that um, I've been going through. So I have my uh, document over here. So um, there's some bug fixes I just want to talk about real quickly. So uh, there was this problem uh, about reading config properly for non-build commands. So what happens here is essentially we had this issue where we allowed uh, folks to come here and set their configs to other builds. So you could do like plenty serve and you could pass a config flag and you could pass it to a non-standard plenty.json file, right? So you could do like plenty.local.json or whatever. Um, and so basically what's happening now is this default is set to plenty.json like this, um, but you can override it um, and you don't have to pass anything at all and it'll be plenty.json. And what happens when you do that is um, essentially it's, it's looking during this serve or build command for that. And so when you were doing non-build style commands, like if you're doing plenty theme update, something like this, or plenty theme add, it was not running that flag. So it was not getting that value. And that was becoming undefined or um, nil in this case in, in Golang. And um, it wasn't able to read the configuration file at all. So it was throwing some errors in that case. So what we did is we pulled that command out. And let's see over here. Um, I, I put that into um, the initial um, command up here. So there's a lot of uh, commands here. One of them is this root command. This runs every time. So now we're checking this in our init um, function in here and we're making, sh oh, sorry, init config. And then we're going through and we're setting that value. So this is something that's kind of weird because circular dependencies are not allowed in Go. So like you cannot pull a package from a child and then pull that same in that child, pull a package from the parent It will not allow a circular dependency. So what we do here is we're just doing a little magic where we're running um, this uh, uh, check config file flag. And what that does in, inside of our reader, it actually just goes in our site config and it will um, check config file flag right here. So we set a local variable here and then we just we check for this flag and we just set it to this. And then we use that in our, our logic. Essentially, what we're doing now is we're setting it so that's available at all times. That's one update. Um, let's see. Yep. Theme commands. Okay. Another thing that we're doing is cleaning themes before updating a theme. So, um, I was having some errors and it might be just due to, um, permissions that you have on certain folders. So, um, if this was using a theme, for instance, and we were doing a plenty theme update like this, say it was using the compendium theme. Um, if there were existing files there, sometimes it would not be able to override those. It'd be like, Hey, there's files here. I don't know what to do with these files. And that was one of the problems. Another one was if you had theme files that were changing. So for instance, one of the, I noticed this initially when I was um, upgrading from a version of Plenty that used to call the layouts folder layout. That was how it initially was. And we changed it to layouts. And essentially if you had downloaded a theme that used layout and then later changed to layouts, 
um, it would download the new layouts folder, but it would leave the old layout folder just kind of hanging out in the background. So what we do now is every time um, that we actually go and we do an update or an add command, we clear out the theme, the specific theme that we're updating in the theme folder. We don't have a theme folder in this case, but um, so if we had, you know, theme uh, and then like compendium in here, uh, what it would do is it would remove all the content in this folder first, and then it would download the new one. So that's cleaning that all up before. Yeah. Download. So that clears those different things, clears up uh, old artifacts and overwriting things on the file system errors. So that's a little better. Um, another thing that has been fixed is the theme exclude um, command. So if you look at the plenty documentation, there is a exclude command. So if we go to docs and we go to themes, you can see that you can exclude certain things in here. So say you only want layouts from a theme, you don't want any of its content you can exclude content or you can exclude its assets. Um, and essentially what was happening here, there was a bug that um, was matching uh, paths that had this in it. So for instance, on every Plenty site, there is a content folder, right? There's also a layouts content folder. And if you were excluding content, it was matching both of these because it was just going through and it was matching the top level folder. And obviously if we just wanna exclude content, we don't wanna exclude the layout because these could be very, integral to the site. So what we're doing now is we're checking the full path. So we're making sure that we're, if, you know, if we're excluding content that does not match layouts content, it has to be layouts content to match that. Um, another thing I want to mention is you could, in your theme, you could exclude um, specific files. So you could say like, you want to exclude just like layouts, content, um, index, dot spell. You could exclude a specific file like that if you wanted to. So this is really powerful. You're not limited to just like these main top level folders. You can exclude anything that you want in your theme and we should match it um, specifically that way. Does that make sense? I know that's kind of abstract. I don't have a good example up right now with a theme here, unfortunately. Um, but does that, does that generally make sense? Why you might want to do that or what that's doing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so because basically what happens, you know, with your theme, your theme gets combined with your local uh, project and they, they kind of like overlap on each other. And so sometimes you don't want all the things from both of those um, different projects. You only want some of it. So that, that's mm -hmm. a theory behind that. Um, another um, update is just better errors. So um, we're trying to add the, the JavaScript stack trace back um, for debugging um, and some better GoPack errors. So GoPack is collecting your dependencies um, and changing your paths and making all that work. Uh, there was a couple of scenarios where those errors weren't very clear, but I've gone through and tried to wrap them with some more helpful information. Again, I'm basically knocking down these error issues as they come. So um, sometimes uh, it's not very clear, but it's hard until I hit those edge cases to actually go through and try to make them more clear. So uh, I'm going through and trying to do it over time, but you should be able to see things like, um, I don't know. If, I think we've gone through some of these error issues before, so I don't want to, to belabor them too much, but now you should see a stack trace if there's um, different things going on. Like for instance, if we um, touch, so I think we did this before, right? Like new, new. So this is going to be a blank JSON file. So if we plenty serve this, it's going to error out, right? Okay. So, I mean, this is, this one actually doesn't need a stack trace just because it tells you exactly the end of the JSON. So that's a, that's a bad example. Um, I don't have one off the top of my head, but uh, some of these are getting better. Um, and if people come across them and they're not very clear, then just flag them in uh, GitHub and we'll go through and we'll try to make the errors better um, going forward. Another thing, um, uh, consolidating asset checking. Uh, so um, we were checking before if things were documents or if they're images, and then we like specified certain images that we allowed in our project here. So this is all happening um in our cms so in our uh where do we have this um in our build up in our defaults in our ejected cms um so now we have this pulled out into an assets checker so essentially we're consolidating these we had this written in a couple different places we had you know our image extensions written in our media browser and in our media grid which is like a child component of that and then anytime that you have something written in several different places, you just are inviting an opportunity for these things to diverge at some point. Like 
you know, uh, in the future, say we want to add a new image format in here, um, you, you, you risk adding it to one place and not the other. So we extract this, put it all in one place. Um, I was having issues when I initially was doing this because I was just calling this file assets.js, but that was conflicting with a file that's actually created. So we have an index uh, that's created in our site for our assets, right? So if you were to come here and look at, whoops, I know this is, no, this is not being served right now because I don't have this running, but let's uh, plenty serve. Alt. Here, do SBA. Expected MS assets dot a s. So we already have an index of all our assets. This is how our CMS is doing media management. Um, so I was trying to name that file that, and it wasn't clear because it's not in my file system. So it wasn't conflicting here, but it's something that gets generated. So we just have to be extra careful in the future, making sure that we know which are the generated files and not try to override them. Um, so that's one thing that's happening there. Um, but also, yeah, so we're checking uh, image extensions. We're checking, we have regex for images. Um, we have doc extensions, regex for docs. This will get more robust over time. This is pretty small right now. Um, and then we do some new asset checking to make sure that we know if something is an asset or not. And this is based on file path. And this is going to be used in kind of the image swapping feature that I'm going to show you in a second. So, um, yeah. Does that make sense, like consolidating those and why we would do that and what's happening with the code there? Is there any clarifications I can do to make that clearer? Um, to be honest, I'm not, I don't really understand it, but um, yeah, it's kind of, it might just be because I don't have any development background. Yeah. And to be fair, this is kind of like, you know, really like um, in the meat and potatoes of of Plenty's engine and not really something you need to know as a user experiencing uh, building sites with Plenty. This is really just something like this actually, these are ejected files, right? So they don't actually ever hit your uh, file system unless you purposely eject them to override them or change them, right? So this is for, for the average user, this is not really needed. This is just, I'm just trying to do a good job of like updating what's actually happening on our end behind the scenes so people understand like some of the stuff that we're doing and going into it for any of the people who are interested in that world. Um, especially folks who want to become contributors at some point. I'm hoping that, you know, getting them up to speed with some of the stuff we're working on this way, maybe it will help them. But um, I would say it's probably not super important that people understand exactly what's happening here. Um, besides the fact that we're trying to make things better uh, all the time. So that's kind of the uptick there. Okay. Um, great. So then the last thing here is just um, how do we do image switching and swapping and uh, how do we, uh, you know, account for um, different scenarios. So, um, you know, uh, for instance, I was having trouble with image switching with recursive and nested images um, being in my content source. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, there's also uh, resetting the field value when the image is swapped. So this is kind of an interesting uh, Stack Overflow post um, that I did not know about with Svelte. So I basically wanted to have a variable update uh, sorry, like, like a function run uh, when a variable changed value, but I didn't want to just do a labeled variable. So they have these this labeled syntax, this dollar sign colon, and you can like basically set a reactive variable that way. You could say variable one equals variable two. Um, and then basically when one variable changes, it changes the other variable. Um, that wasn't going to work in my specific case because uh, there were times when I, I did not want that temporary va variable oversetting a field value. So I wanted to actually run a function in order to do that um, in you can do that um, like this. It's this strange syntax. So you you watch your variable that's changing, and then you can do your function. Uh, it might be a little more clear down here like this, so you can see how it's there uh, set up here, and that's what we're using. So I'll show all that in a second. I wanted to show at a high level what I'm talking about, first of all, with um, uh, image swapping. So we're trying to do media management, right? So if you were to come here and click on media, you know, we have a media library like this. And you can do things like download them. But like, how do you actually interact with these on your page? Like, how do you... It's great, you can upload media, you can download it, you can delete it, but how do I put it on my page, right? So that's kind of like the big question. If I come here to a blog post and I were to edit an individual blog post, now we are doing that regex that I was talking about. So it's looking in a content source and it's trying to find what our media file. So this is a media file. It has assets and it ends in one of our known file extensions. Um, so we know that this is a media file. Uh, so we can take that and we can render that out over here and we can give some context here. So we can say, uh, can I change this? So I can click on edit and I could change this to two. And if, once I view, it should set it. So this is another image that we have in our thing. So that's editing the path directly. 
Um, let me change that back. I'm going to change this to one. And then when I view, it should save it. Um, well, save it to your, your front end display. If you want to save these things, ultimately you have to, you have to come down here and save it to your, your file system. Make sure that people are aware of that. But I'm not sure that this is kind of the way that I think most people are going to want to interact with media, like editing tasks. I think that's kind of a confusing experience. And I'm almost of the mind that I want to remove this edit functionality completely, because if you are familiar with editing paths, you could always come up here and you could edit the path back here. Like you could do the same exact thing, right? You could do it like that. So um, I might remove that. But the thing that I think that is valuable is this change button. And again, these are, need to be styled. They don't look very good right now, but you can click change. And what change does is it pops up your media browser and then you can come in here and you can say, okay, I don't want the shoes anymore, but I want this picture of the markers and stuff. So you can click on it that way and it'll swap it out on your page. And then you could go through because say, okay, this is on my page now. And if you went back to your blog page, it propagates here. So it's now on your blog page as well. Um, yeah. And you could come through here. You could change it to anything you want. So you could say, maybe we want, oops, sorry. I want the change come here. Maybe I want the color swatches. So you could do that or we could change it to the rolls of tape. Um, so this really gives you like a, a quick ability to go through and manage the media on your existing pages and swap them out on the pages. Um, when you were happy with something like that, you would actually want to come down here and save it to make sure it's permanent because um, this will disappear the next time you reload the page. Um, but yeah, does that make sense? Does that seem like a, besides the, you know, the blemishes around the, these little buttons, not looking like buttons. Um, th does that seem like a, a workflow that kind of makes sense from a content editing standpoint? Yeah. Yeah. Um, does the CMS, like if you have an existing site, um, and then you update your plenty to with, with these new updates, whenever that's released, is it going to automatically identify the assets like the pictures? Yeah. And so that's a, that's a good point. So, and this is a, a case where, um, I had to change this theme to make sure it was doing that. So I'm trying, so everything right now is this, this on the side is this thing that we're calling the discoverable CMS. Um, we're debating about the name, but I've been calling it discoverable CMS. So what it does is it looks at your content, your content source, and it tries to discover what you're doing. So for instance, it discovers that this is a date, right? It comes over here and says, okay, this is a date. Now we have a date picker. You can just choose today and it updates it, right? It looks at this and says, I don't know, this looks like a standard text field. It comes over here, gives it a standard text field. And then it looks up here and it says, this is an asset, right? So it comes over here and it says, okay, I think this is an asset and it tries to work with it as an asset. So if you are writing your content source and I, I would typically do this in a project, like what I would do is I would say, okay, we probably just need this to be, you know, project thumb like this. And then we could add the assets because it's always going to be in the assets folder. We can add that in our Svelte template, right? Um, and that's just an image. The problem with that is that we're not giving enough, enough context to reliably know that this is um, actually an image and not just like a piece of text for some reason. Like, you know, you, you could have a, a technical blog that is talking about an image, right? And we don't want to change that into an image field. We just want that to be text that is talking about an image, right? So we want to be careful of not <laughs> converting things that don't represent images into that image field. So if you were to write your, your project like this and you were to come over here, you'll notice that is no longer getting the image um, field. You're actually just editing this as a simple text. So I guess what you have to do in your project, if you want these capabilities, you want to make sure that you're, oops, put that in the wrong spot. You want to make sure that you're actually representing these things in a, in a clear way that they're images. So starting with the assets folder, ending with one of the supported file types. And that's how you define that something's an image. And that's how we'll discover that it's an image. So you might have to go through and think about your projects a little differently. So somewhere where you might typically just put the image and then hard code the rest of the stuff in your template, you might want to think about putting the full image source into your content just so it works with the CMS out of the box. Is that, did that clear your question up or? Yeah, um, but so will it, will it know the whole image library as well? Like, will it find, as long as it, I guess it, you have everything in your assets folder, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it should. So basically, um, this media browser will find your whole library, right? It should, yeah. but there's still some bugs here. Um, but this should find your whole image, your image library. Right. Um, cool. but, um, what happens, uh, on your content sources, like your individual content sources, where you're specifying where to use things. Right. So it's like, you could have images up here all day that are not anywhere in your content source. They're not referenced anywhere. Right. Um, so only, you're only swapping out images that are actually referenced somewhere. And so you go to that place where it's actually referenced and then you can swap it out.
I feel like you have a question on this. I don't. I, oh, okay. no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, and then you should have your your full library available to you at that point, right? Like you should, when, when you're changing, you should have the full library. Um, I'm still working on getting this working. You should also be able to upload a new file here. So you should be able to click, you know, new file and upload right from there. Um, and then that should save to your library and it should also swap this out here uh, and put it in your source. So yeah, so that's that's coming along. Um, again, just to show that, that Stack Overflow post, let me see if I can find that. So in the dynamic form input, this is where most of the discovery is of the CMS is happening in this file called dynamic form input. And essentially just going through and it's trying to figure out what fields we're, we're using. And then it's trying to set that up. So this is the new kind of like, if it is asset. So that's pulling from the asset checker and it's pulling this is asset, which we're basically, um, we're setting up a regular expression to find those asset paths, right? Like we're saying, does it start with the assets folder? Um, with a trailing, uh, sorry, a preceding slash, maybe it has one, maybe it doesn't because you know, the way base URLs work and then saying, okay, um, any of our image extensions or any of our document extensions, um, are at the end of the file. Um, if that's the case, then test this and that'll give us a, a positive result. And then we can basically say over here, okay, it looks like we have an asset. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to say, are we editing this asset? It's like, no. Okay. Well then give a thumbnail for the asset and then give the options to edit or change it. And then if we are editing it, then we're going to go through and we're going to do a lot of other stuff. We're actually going to pass this, these field values back up. We're going to, you know, hook into the media browser and get all that stuff working. Um, and then we're because we have to adjust the behavior of the media browser, right? If you're, um, for instance, if you're over here, let me just I'm gonna reload this. If you're over here and you're using your media browser, um, typically, and you're clicking on this stuff, it just wants you to select it like this. And it wants you to either download or delete media. But that's a different behavior than if you're coming over here and you're editing and you're swapping, right? If you're editing or swapping, what happens when you click on this is it actually it's grabbing that and it's putting it over here. So there's a different behavior here, but we're using the same media browser, right? So um, essentially what we have to do is we have to hook into that. Um, and that's how, uh, that's why we're binding a couple of these values. So, um, by binding, so, um, exporting a variable, uh, allows us to, um, take in a value from a parent. Um, but then on the parent, and again, this is probably su super deep in the weeds, um, but on the parent itself. So for instance, this dynamic form comes from the visual editor, um, where we're actually, uh, passing this is right here. So show media uh, and changing asset, we're binding it because we want to be able to pass changed values from a, a child component up to a parent component. And that's what we're doing there. So we're binding it to do that. Um, and then this bubbles all the way up to the uh, media browser. And then we do some checks in the media browser to actually say, okay, what are we doing with this here? Can, like, are we trying to download it or are we trying to select it and put it into a content source? So that's what, that's what the thinking is there. And I know that's super deep level. Um, and if I can just for one more second, go super deep. Um, one of the issues I was having is I was, I was able to get this, um, to work at the top level, but if I have it nested, like, um, I do now. So for instance, this is, this is within a, an object here, right? So image, um, it used to be top level. Um, it would just be like image and then like the source right here at the top. Right. Um, but now I put it in this, um, object syntax here. Um, so I could basically, uh, group the source and the alt because I, I want like the source of the image and then the alternative text for accessibility to be grouped together. Um, we're having issues actually getting this to work with that. If it was at the top level, it worked fine. But if it was nested within an array or an object like this, then it was having trouble. And that's because down here, when we actually um, put things within either uh, an object or an array, uh, what we do is we recursively call the component. So we use this thing called spelt self to recursively call this template. And we pass, you know, the field, the new field value, which is the child and the label um, into it. But one of the problems is I was not passing these other exported props that I, I basically added to this component recently. So show media and changing asset. Um, I was not passing that in. So they were not getting those values. So essentially they would not know that we were, you know, pulling up the media browser and, and things like that. So essentially when we're doing the recursion, we're passing that now. And that's how we fix that bug. Um, so that was kind of throwing me for a loop for a little bit, but that's super deep. Uh, I know that's probably really confusing what I'm talking about there. That's really just mostly for people who are in the weeds of the internals of how plenty in the CMS is working. Um, that's just how that stuff actually works behind the scenes. Okay. I think that's really all I had to cover here. Um, I know that was probably a lot, uh, 
did you have any thoughts or feedback before we uh, stop the call? No, it's, it's coming along. I, you know, it's just a lot of good progress. So keep it going. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks. I think there's, you know, it's a lot of bugs for now. Um, we're trying to get the, the plumbing working, but there's, there's lots of edge cases and quirks to it. But um, if folks test it out and identify those, we'll just make it better over time. I think this, this first phase is just getting it working on some level and uh, it'll be polished up on the next phase. So um, yeah, stay tuned for more progress, I guess. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Jim.